So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, European Funding, Finding Solutions to Systematic Challenges. My name is Chloe Hill. I'm the Policy Officer for the European Geosciences Union and a member of the Initiative for Science in Europe's Task Force on Researchers' Careers. Now, this ISE Task Force has recently published a report that focuses on the precarity of academic careers. It outlines three key areas that need to be addressed, and these are the funding of academic careers, research assessment practices, and research grant evaluation. The report, which I can highly recommend you take a look at after today's webinar, outlines some of the issues around these key themes and some potential solutions. But we don't just want to stop at publishing this report. We also want to create a discussion and think about how the needed changes can actually be implemented. This is why the ISC has also created a three-part webinar series. Each webinar will focus on a different aspect of the report. Today is the first in this webinar series and it will focus on the funding of academic careers. So if you're attending this webinar, you are probably already aware of some of the key issues. In recent years, Europe's research system has relied heavily on the increase of short term on often project based funding. This has increased the number of early career researchers contributing to research, but it has also introduced high job insecurity, a tendency to value quantity over quality and triggered some negative competitive behaviours. Today we're going to discuss these as well as some of the other issues caused by the current funding system and some of the potential solutions. So to do this, we have a fabulous panel that is going to be introduced by Martin Andler, ISE's president. So Martin, I am now going to hand over the virtual microphone to you so you can introduce ISE as well as our speakers. Thank you, Chloe. <clears throat> I'm very happy to introduce, just say a few words of introduction. So ISE is an organization, a nonprofit organization, association whose members are learned societies and scientists organization in Europe. Our role is to carry the voice of the science communities on issues of science policy and general issues of science and, and society. So we are very much in our role to be initiating this webinar. I'm happy to welcome uh, four distinguished speakers today, Maria da Gracia Carvalho, uh, who is a former Minister of Science in Portugal and presently member of the European Parliament. Um, Maria Ivancheva, who is a, a professor of social anthropology at the University of Liverpool and a member of the European Association of Social Anthropology. Wim van Zalos, who is a professor of theoretical physics in Leiden and former president of the Dutch Academy of Science, and Rachel Coulthard Graf, who is a careers counselor, I mean, a biologist, I understand, by training and careers counselor at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. So I think we should not wait and start with the discussion right now. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Martin. So just for everyone who's joined us here today, I'd like to let you know that during this discussion, I have a couple of my own burning questions that I'm going to be asking the speakers, but we'd also really like to hear your questions. So down the bottom of your screens, you will see a QA and a box, and I would really encourage you to put any questions you have for our speakers into this box. You can also see the, speak the questions that other, panel uh, other participants have asked, and you can upvote these. So I do encourage you to put your questions into the Q&A box during today. Um, and now, without further ado, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves, their positions, and their views on research funding um, a little bit more. So to start, I am going to let uh, Wim van Salos uh, have the floor. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Chloe. It's a pleasure for me to join this webinar because it is indeed on a very urgent theme, uh, theme in science these days. Um, I'm a, as Martin already said, I'm a physicist, and in the last few years, I was first vice president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. You see the logo behind me, uh, and then I was the president. I stepped down in June, 
And during these four years with the academy, I have one of the main things that I had to do is actually to engage in the discussion in the Netherlands about many of the themes that are on the table today. Um, because the Dutch system, the university system is, I think, under quite a bit of pressure. And you see many of the trends that are described in this wonderful position paper by ISC, uh, you already see very prominent in our system. Um, before telling you a bit about that, uh, I would like to make one remark. That is, the various uh, science systems in our countries in Europe all have their own historical path, their own particular way of funding universities or grant, uh, grant agencies, etc. So you will probably, not everything will fit probably what you're familiar with, but I, I do think by and large we see similar trends in, in uh, our various countries. Um, in the Netherlands in particular, the trend has, the, the problem that is being described in this position paper is due to a trend which I would say has been existing for about 20 years or so. You should know we have about 13 universities which are all relatively at the same level. They're all say quite high in the Times Higher Education ranking, but not in the absolute top, but more in the sub top. And so there's not much competition between the universities. They're all uh, government funded and our universities have to basically take all the students that apply to them. That is, there's no selection process. And so over the years, the number of students in higher education in the Netherlands has increased enormously. Just to give you some idea, my own university in Leiden, um, from the year 2000, we had, then we had 12,000 students. Now we have 32,000 students. So that's almost a tripling in about 20 years. And you see similar trends throughout uh, our country. Now, our budget is actually determined sort of beforehand by the government, the budget for universities, and that's relatively independent of the number of students. But the way the money is distributed is to the market share of a university. And so what this has given is sort of a red race to the bottom, because universities, in order to keep their funding, have to admit all these, as many students as they can. Then they have to shift more attention and money to the teaching, just in facilities, in, in making available a sufficient number of people. That has drained within our universities money away from research. So the researchers go to the funding agency for every nitty gritty detail and every small grant. Then of course the application, the, the number of applications goes up, the acceptance rate goes down, frustration goes up. And so this is the vicious circle worrying. So as I said, I've been very much involved in trying to get plans on the table to break this vicious circle, because just pumping more money into the system is not the solution in, in the minds of, of, well, I think myself, but, um, but also that is something that is now more or less common wisdom in our country. So let me mention very briefly three things. In the document uh, under discussion, you already see a reference to a national well, panel or discussion and, and trend, which is going under the name of recognition and reward system. We are rethinking uh, the way we reward and recognize and acknowledge the contributions of our individual scientists, not just doing everything excellent in research and in teaching and in outreach and in knowledge transfer. That's more difficult than you would think because that really means rethinking the way we look at people, having more attention for team science, etc. Secondly, um, we're trying to balance the rebalance the system between the universities and our granting agency to break this circle where everyone has to go to the granting agency uh, to apply for every little piece of funding. Um, that's not so easy, um, but we have a few national programs now um, being established to strengthen the universities. And a third initiative, which the government actually starts to like, is something that we call the rolling grant system. Some of you are familiar with the American system may know the word, but very briefly, we have, we are in the process of uh, convincing our government that you should establish grants that will take a longer time that are not just a project and that then ends, but that every researcher has a particular, not that large, but at least some budget that keeps on going so that they have some freedom to follow their own uh, uh, ideas and thoughts. And that we think will create more, um, well, more continuity 
and less stress in the system. There are more initiatives that I can touch about later, but I think I should leave it at this for now. Great, thank you so much, Vim. And there's already a lot to think about there and I'm already writing down questions as I go for you. So thank you so much for that. Um, the next person I'd like to hand the virtual microphone over to is Marie Ivancheva. Thank you and thanks for the invite. So as much as I would like to be a professor, I'm actually a lecturer in higher education studies and not in social anthropology at the University of Liverpool. And I represent the European Association of Social Anthropologists, but I also represent a group Precantro, precarious anthropologists within it. And this group has been formed since 2016 within the kind of broader framework of um, the association more as a pressure group to put the question of precarity on the agenda. Um, and with the help of the association, we run a big survey report in 2018 that we have just uh, a survey which we have just written the report of, um, which I can share the link with you later. Um, but uh, this survey report was uh, written by Martin Fota, myself, and Rauka Perner. And uh, it found or rather confirmed some worrying trends within the discipline. You know, which, which we know from academic literature and a lot of by now popular literature on precarity, not only in researchers' careers, but also in teaching careers across Europe. So some of the most um, kind of worrying findings is that what we found that among our members, most of whom are employed in academia, 49% are on uh, precarious uh, fixed term contracts. And um, a lot of them, even if like the, there are no gender differences in absolute terms, but in a relatively large proportion of the sample, which is 63% being women, women hold the shortest contracts. 70% of the contracts last six months or less for, for women. And only 48% of contracts, fixed term contracts are, are of over three years. Um, there is, of course, significant difference across um, the continent, but whereas we see um, anthropology as uh, humanities and social sciences as a more like a career where women are more represented on top, there are a lot of women who stay on the bottom, especially in teaching positions. And men and women are similarly affected at each and every level by soaring workloads and what's more, uh, by an increased number of hours spent on applying for funding, which we are all pushed into. A lot of this funding is not successful. And there is a growing understanding of overtime work and um, increased workloads across you know, um, the profession, which um, poses a very important question, how, how much time do we actually spend on applications? And is that uh, time worth the while of our students, of the broader uh, society that is also paying tax for uh, especially public uh, institutions? And then, of course, the question is not how to use an argument like this in order to scrap funding from public institutions, but how do we rethink um, what what is um, like what is higher education? What's the public good that it brings to society? And how do we make more sustainable research investment um, rather than um, allowing this cyclical funding, which produces a, a pyramid that is very dangerous? And the, this pyramid is uh, functions like this. On top, you have a, like a small number of PIs who stop being researchers themselves, they start being fundraisers and managers of research teams. So they're less and less engaged in producing ideas and producing knowledge and more and more engaged in managing knowledge. So it is a completely new skill set that has to be developed. And this uh, results in two things. One is having managers instead of scientists on top of the pyramid, but the other is uh, even scientists are failing in uh, producing good management uh, practices. 
Um, then comes the, the kind of level at which we have pre precarious, usually postdocs and researchers who are usually a highly mobile workforce, especially within the European framework. So this is a career that is mostly available to uh, careless, you know, childless women or men who can move their families across borders um, rather than, you know, keeping local. And then at the bottom is a, a bigger, like growing number of teaching only more and more precarious faculty uh, who, I mean, we can, we can argue how the gender, race, class balance is there because it might be different in different professions. But definitely these are people who have certain caring commitments and commitments to locality uh, that make them continue taking up positions in universities locally rather than being able to play the research game and move across border to top up their credit. So this needs to be rethought completely because it, it produces crap science, it produces crap education, and it is not a sustainable model. So it is quite urgent that beyond only the question of precarity and insecurity and instability of a whole new generation of scientists' lives, we're also thinking of how this affects education and science in Europe. Thanks so much, Maria. So it's a lot of uh, cross-cutting issues there that go across a lot of different topics, I think, as well, but some really, really important ones that we'll bring into the discussion. Um, so I'll, I'll now uh, give Rachel the floor to give her a little introduction. Thank you, Clary. Um, so my name is Rachel Coulter-Graff. As Martin said, I'm a career advisor at EMBL, um, and, but my background is in science, so I did a PhD in structural biology before I moved into science administration. My first role was a, actually one of ISC's member organizations, EMBO, the European Molecular Biology Organization, where I was involved in helping coordinate a program that supports young group leaders, so the, the first stage of the PI. Um, role that Maria mentioned. Um, yeah, so supporting these group leaders across Europe. Um, in that role, I became increasingly interested in, in career issues for scientists. And in 2016, I then moved to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, EMBL, as a career advisor for um, initially just postdocs. Um, so I provide career guidance for postdocs, but also organize a wide range of, of training and career development initiatives aimed at PhDs and postdocs across EMBL six sites across Europe. And I mean, based on, on these experiences, I can only second what, what the, uh, the previous panelists have mentioned and, and really highlight the problems that researchers are facing because of this kind of really steep pyramid of the increasing numbers of undergraduate students, increasing numbers of um, PhD students, and increasing numbers at this um, precarious postdoc and researcher level. Um, and we know that these numbers have been increasing a lot. Um, for example, in, in Europe, we saw a 44% increase in um, PhD students between 2004 and 2012, but the higher level positions haven't had the same increase in positions. So there was a 9% increase in academic staff in, in Europe in that time. And this has led to a real bottleneck in the careers, people cycling through these short-term contracts. And that has I think, a big impact on those researchers. Um, there's a lot of of surveys and studies being done showing that there are real high levels of concern about career progression in this group, which not only impacts those individual researchers, um, there has been some indications that this might be linked to the high levels of mental health issues in academia compared to other professions, but I think it also affects academia's ability in future to attract and retain the best talent. And we know that a lot of researchers will go into other types of careers. And from the, the people, from the alumni I've seen from EMBL, I know that the vast majority of those are in positions where um, a PhD is at least advantageous, in most cases required. 
um, and is contributing to research and innovation either directly or indirectly. Um, but it's not the academic career that those researchers were aiming at when they went into to postdoc and researcher positions. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of issues to discuss here about how we can change funding to really improve the careers of those people and make sure that academia can also do the, the best research. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Rachel. And I will just also mention, remind the participants to, if you have any questions for individual speakers or for the entire panel, you can put them into the Q&A box. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Member of the European Parliament, Maria Cavallo, um, to just welcome, uh, welcome you and also give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a bit more and highlight some of the, the key issues you think exist in terms of research funding. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation and um, congratulations to the organizers because you have chosen a very important topic. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm um, a member of the European Parliament. Uh, uh, it's my second term. I was uh, in the Parliament between 2009 and 14, and that, at that time I was uh, one of the reporters of Horizon 2020. Um, now in this new uh, um, term. I'm at the moment rapporteur of the or negotiator of the resolution that we are preparing on the European research area and also rapporteur on the partnerships uh, inside Horizon Europe. Um, in the past, I have been twice minister of, with the responsibility of higher education, science and innovation. And also I have worked in the European Commission also in this area of the, uh, in the area of science and innovation. Um, I would like to, to initially to tell you about um, the European perspective for, for uh, the, the issue that you are um, discussing the, the European funding and the, uh, the career of the researchers' careers and also related that the, the, um, the teachers and the uh, university uh, universities' careers. Uh, we, we, at European Union uh, level, we have two main uh, instruments, uh, I would say a funding instrument and the policy and that are the main one, the main tools to do in the area of research and innovation. Uh, from the funding instrument is our framework program of, of, uh, that start to be only on research and uh, technological development and today's research and, um, and innovation. And as you know, we, we in the European Parliament, we always defend a better funding uh, for uh, the framework programs and we had until very recently a big uh, fight for more funding for research and innovation. Uh, we managed to increase a bit, not as much as we would like to, uh, because we had uh, quite a lot of opposition from the, the council. Uh, I would say all member states, uh, we didn't have anyone in our side, but we managed to even like that uh, to have in the end um, a program that is 95.5 billion euros that corresponds if you take into account that now we don't have the UK an increase of 30% uh, compared with Horizon uh, 2020. However, we our initial proposal in the parliament was more, is 120. Um, because we think that uh, uh, we are the uh, Horizon Europe and the framework programs in general are the, the, the most important uh, tool to face challenge that uh, and the ambitions that Europe has uh, in front uh, uh, in the near and uh, in the medium term future. Uh, and this was proved. That, now, just uh, recently with the pandemic, it was exactly because we had uh, um, a good funding for, for research and innovation and uh, our system is well designed that uh, uh, we had the first and the very innovative vaccines, uh, both BioNTech, BioNTech more because there's been 
um, constantly and sustainably funded by the framework programs that start, I suppose, even before SP5, uh, to develop the concept. And the CEO of BioMTech had, at the moment had the European Research uh, Council of Scholarship to develop this technology, and it was uh, to be applied to cancer vaccine. Uh, after he he was also developing an idea how to apply to to um, flu uh, to a flu vaccine, and because he was doing this this research, he was able in a very short time to redirect when the pandemic starts of the COVID nineteen to redirect his research work and to develop this innovative vaccine in less than one year. So after the deployment and the, the later stage were also financed by Horizon 2020 at the time and, and through the EIB, the European Investment Bank. So we are quite um, uh, happy and was a reassurance that uh, the, the program is well designed and the, 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 the fact that uh, we are financing research that is not, uh, do not have a set agenda. So we don't set the priorities, but it's very, is, uh, is fundamental for the, the solution of the problems that we still do not know. And they may arrive uh, any time, like it was the case of COVID-19. Um, so, but these are supposed to be complementary and uh, supplementary to the national uh, funding system. There's a small per percentage of the, and is a project base, most of the time three years. It can be in the partnerships longer, seven years, but uh, it is designed to, to in the um, uh, conditions that there is a base, a base for financing that is uh, provided by the uh, member states to their own research, they, they, funding, uh, they are funding their research in a sustainable and an efficient and su sufficient way. They um, um, research and higher education systems. Um, the second uh, uh, important uh, tool that we have is a policy tool, is the European Research Area. Uh, actually, it, it is in the treaty, it was introduced in the Lisbon Treaty in 2009, the concept of uh, European Research Area in Article 179. Um, and uh, uh, through the European Research Area, we may um, touch and deal with the, 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 the research systems uh, all in the European Union, because it is said, even if it's not our responsibility, we, uh, the, in, the, in this article of the treaty said that we should promote all the research activities in the European Union, promote the uh, the freedom of, of uh, researchers and, uh, and scientists and uh, the mobility. And so there are principles there that are very important to tackle to the, the, the scientific system as a whole. Um, what we have seen along the years, the first uh, uh, communication launching the European Research Area was one year after the, the, the Lisbon Treaty. So during the Portuguese presence in 2000, um, and th there has been ups and downs in the priority that the uh, European Commission has given to the European research area. Usually what we can see when you look back from 2000 is that the, the, the period that we are preparing a framework program, the European research area is not so uh, high in the agenda. So now that we, we just have approved our uh, framework program. Uh, I think that the area is going to be again, and this it is, we can see from the speech of our commissioner, Commissioner Maria Gabriel, that the European research area is uh, a priority. And there we can do a lot of recommendations to, to the member states, to the society in general, to the, the research institutions, the research organizations. Uh, even if they are not directly a responsibility of 
uh, the, at European level. Um, so we had 2000, we had again in 2012 a new edition of ERA, and last September in 2020, uh, uh, we have the third communication uh, by already this college, Maria Gabriel, and there are some novelties. Um, uh, and the novelty is that the, um, the Commission wants to deal also with the innovation, with the triangle of knowledge. We have already the European higher education area, uh, we had the European research area, and now uh, they are adding this concept on the European innovation area together with the research area. This is important because uh, the situation of researchers that is one uh, quite critical as the previous speakers have uh, all uh, stressed um, cannot be solved only by the public sector or the, the, the public research uh, um, sector. It's also very important that we have a strong private sector um, and the innovation that absorbs part of our researchers and that they uh, also have a, a different choices uh, where to work and to work in good conditions. And so this is the main novelty for, for from the Maria Gabriel um, communication. We are now, as I told you, preparing our resolution in the parliament. Uh, I think that from my side that I will be the, rapport, the um, negotiator from EPP. I think that one important point that I want to stress is the, um, the individual autonomy and the freedom of researchers as a principle or the, the questions of uh, fundamental principles uh, from scientists and researchers, but I also want to, to stress the, the situation of the research careers. Uh, as I told you again, also uh, the, 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 private, the involvement of the private sector is an important topic, but in the public sector, we need to make sure uh, that we uh, have good conditions um, and not uh, precarious conditions to, to, to our researchers. And uh, the good conditions is also a question on the, on the salary, on the precarity, but also good conditions to work, because that is also very important uh, for the, to, to attract the researchers and to keep the, the researchers. Um, so we need to create the good conditions, the, the, the scientific equipment, the good labs, the, 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 the access to information, uh, all the conditions that the, the researchers can do their work, can publish and can go on, on their, um, uh, along their career. So that is also a topic that I want to, uh, to stress. Um, I want to stress the gender issue, that uh, we still have a big problem on gender issue, more in some areas than others. I just did a report on the gender issue, or the gender gap, huge gap in the, everything that is digital, modeling, high-performance computing, AI, cyber. Is, uh, we have around 15, 17% of women, and there are areas that, for example, they, they, they are very present in the private sector with very good salaries and our women are completely, especially in the private sector, they are, uh, uh, these numbers are even lower because when you have, you have this, uh, these uh, figures are mainly from the public sector. So we are increasing the pay gap and the retirement gap that is, uh, that is very worrying. So measures on the gender and specific measures for the early stage of the academic careers and younger researchers. And there, this situation was uh, is still more uh, profound now due to the consequence of the pandemics. They were the ones that were suffering more, uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the, the fact that they have been confined and they have to, to, to um, combine the, the, uh, their family life with, the, as it was already referred here, with their work life. Uh, but also um, sometimes they don't have proper uh, access to their laboratories and, and they need to do their research. Of course, we don't want that, that they uh, have access without uh, safety and uh, not in good conditions, but it's important that the institutions create the conditions that they can 
continue their research work. And also very, that I think that is very important is the exposure and the network that is important in the beginning of your career. Um, it's, not, it's important to all the scientists, but the, if you are a well-established scientist, you, you already can survive doing your networking uh, and continue to, to be well-known and publish. Uh, uh, doing your network in uh, uh, virtual, but if you are starting, if you are not yet uh, well known, it's very important that you are there, that you talk, that you, and that is really uh, damaging the the um, the young scientists, and I think that is even worse for the uh, the women uh, young scientists. But that is something that would give a lot of. Uh, uh, discussion. So these are po points that I would like to do recommendations and uh, uh, I will uh, get inspired also for your papers and what has been said here and I so uh, invite you to, we, we are very soon finished so it's a, it's a kind of one week so also uh, if you have recommendations that we, you are very welcome to send me a, an email and thank you very much again for the invitation. Hey, thank you so much, Maria. I think uh, there were some really important updates in the current situation, the current funding situation that's happening in Europe right now. Um, and also some really some really key points that I think we are gonna get into the discussion in um, right now. So things like the good conditions for work is something that I'm definitely gonna be following up on in the next few minutes. Um, I think all of our speakers have actually already outlined a lot of the key structural funding issues that we have. So I, I'm actually gonna go straight on to um, some of the some of the potential solutions and I know we have we do already have some questions coming into the Q&A right now um, some of our speakers have actually already started answering these questions but I will go back to these questions and 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 use those as part of the discussion as well so if you're asking these questions um, and they have been answered they might be re-asked to the entire panel and so we can bring them up for discussion um, and I would just encourage you to continue asking those questions um, and so we can we can answer them as a panel as well so the first question I'm going to be asking is actually one of my own taking my liberate my my liberty as moderator here um which is how can more long-term funding for science and researchers actually be created so this was brought up by i think almost all of the speakers the issue of short-term funding um how can how can we establish more long-term funding and who is actually responsible for this so i think i'll let um i don't know who wants to jump in first here I will open this question up for the entire panel though, and you can bounce off each other as well. Maybe Wim, if you wanna jump in. Sure, I'd be willing to jump in. Um, I would say actually the fact that Europe has the framework <coughs> programs of seven years is already a good example of setting a longer term. As I, Maria has, has missed this, but uh, probably, but um, I mentioned, in my contribution that also in our country there has been an increasing tendency to short-term uh, projects and to jump from one project to the other and Maria uh, Ivancheva has also touched on this quite a bit because that actually gives this a lot of the people that are on short-term projects. So I think one uh, helpful thing is already to and that is what we're doing in, in the Netherlands right now to argue that we should also refocus our science system on the longer term um, programs. And actually that's also helpful for reaching out to society because the great societal challenges are really not things that you can do for a few years and then solve them and jump to the next. To have also a longer term outlook is, is good there as well. I think that this is where two things come together. I can see Rachel leaning forward here. Yeah, trying to find the unmute button. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely, as as Wim said, the the longer term funding generally is is needed. I think specifically at the postdoc stage, one of the very first things we should be looking at is the the length of the fellowships there. So most postdoctoral fellowships are only two or three years, which in experimental sciences is 
very difficult to get a project to completion in that time frame, um, which means that people are then on patchwork funding with different contracts and, and that makes it very difficult for them to contribute to, to big scientific projects. Am I maybe jumping up? So I think there are a number of issues that were touched upon earlier, but probably need to be restated in, in a different way. One is we need funding that goes directly to institutions rather than attached to individual scholars. Um, that is something that will, and, and we need discretionary budgets for institutions that they can decide if they want to put into teaching or they want to put into research or what. Because in a certain way, what, what we're still doing by speaking of researchers' careers and not speaking of academic careers is we are saying we care more about research stuff than about teaching stuff. Now, which, which already has created a very dangerous division, which we can now see in, for instance, how the World Bank and the OECD are thinking about these things. So we have, on the one hand, science innovation and technology, like bracketed out as research. And this is developed completely with industries, as if it has nothing to do with education and nothing to do with, with research that's done academically. On the other hand, we have something that is now becoming also very dangerous, that is also um, proliferating precarity in academia, which is more and more teaching only contracts that are now increasing in terms of short courses, in terms of online only programs, outsourcing through the new affordances of digital technologies in education. So these are now the new topics of education are unbundling digital disruption and so on and so forth. So we're having a conversation that, that bursts open something that used to be like more or less an, an integrated mission of the public university and not only of the public, but not the university. And, and we're having almost like an argument who is to invest where. So the universities are saying we care about students and that's kind of management. We care about student experience. And um, how are we going to invest in student experience? Well, we're going to get more PIs with great research so that we kind of attract the best students here. And then we're going to teach them with teaching only precarious staff, ideally outsourced, but that's fine. And then what do we do with research? Well, research gets external funding and at best, and I see one question in the forum, like that's research and development industry. Now, there are like two great fallacies there. One is that, um, you know, when we think of like also outsourcing research, we are not gonna solve the problem of academic labor if we just say like researchers are gonna get careers elsewhere because at present we're facing such enormous crisis and recession that each and every sector is going to be suffering. So it's not going to be just saying, okay, you know, like this problem is not for me, it's somewhere else. Secondly, like what we're seeing now, and it's also more dangerous, is how on this basis, universities are more and more pushed to make uh, contracts with industries in a very perverse way, which is not to say that there is more funding from industries invested in academia, but there is more encouragement of public-private partnerships in research in which researchers are employed at university contracts at more and more precarious short-term funding regimes. And they're uh, producing patents and products for industry and under the terms of ethics that industry implies. So we're, we have to really challenge this very perverse uh, kind of reproduction of a market logic in education and in research. And we're not going to be doing that just by saying, you know, let's outsource research outside, let's outsource teaching and like have them have the two debates separate. We have to have the, the debate about academic careers at once. And it has to be through serious investment, both in terms of the European Union's redistribution and funding and of individual nation states into like universities as institutions into long-term programs, into sustainable teaching models that create uh, critically thinking citizens and not robots for factories. And so like, just to finish on that point, I think um, there is one more point which Vim uh, raised in the beginning about the different systems that exist across Europe. The problem is that 
yes, there is a, a whole periphery of Europe, which some of us come from, and Bulgaria, you know, where the, the question of investment in science and technology and universities is very poor. And it is not necessarily by the design of our nation states. It is also a design of an unequal system of redistribution of labor, unequal system of uh, redistribution of natural resources and so on and so forth. So there have to be bigger questions that are posed about how do we invest equally in the development of science and technology across Europe and not how do we give more money to those that have already acquired a lot of money in the past. Maybe I can just add there as well. I, I totally agree. And one point I would add is we need to have a better evidence base for this. So we need to be able to say what is the needs in terms of teaching staff? What will be the needs in terms of industry? What is the need in, in academia? And what is the need in other career areas where um, people with a strong academic background can add value to the economy? And I think there's a, been a lot of, of talk of, of career tracking. I think there was a, a report last week um, on different ways of doing that, but this is something which I think needs to be pushed more and into action, not just how we do it, but actually doing it. Um, and I think within the EU, there's, there's quite good data in terms of how many undergraduates there are, how many PhDs there are, but who is on what type of contract within academia is really difficult because of the national systems being so very different. And if we can find ways to, to better address those questions, I think this, this would be really critical. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Maria Cavallo, do you want to step in? Um, I want to stress that from the European uh, Commission and the Parliament, we have tried to uh, increase the, the time of the contracts. And for example, some years ago, the framework, the, the, the EU budget was five years and after we changed to seven, uh, we tend to, to try to increase the, 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 the grants, uh, but we always have in mind that they, this one are the short term because the member states should finance the sustainability and the, um, of, the, um, of the research and, and higher education. Um, but we have, for example, the partnerships are seven years. The European Institute of Technology that I was also a reporter, we just finished it. The, the kicks that are the, the areas, the knowledge and innovation communities are 15 years. And in this report, that is the second phase of the, the EIT, we even extended for the, the, the kicks that are now finishing the 15 years that they can continue under certain circumstances, special the activities that they are doing that are further away from the market, like higher education, training, um, they can continue to, to receive uh, public funding of the EU. So we are at the tendency in the, um, in the European Union is uh, centrally at the, the community level is um, to, to, under, to understand that we need uh, time to, to get results. Um, the second point that I want to, to stress and is a warning for, for all of you is that we member states are going to receive extra funding due to the recovery plan, all the member states. The member states are now in the, the, uh, in the next few days, few weeks, going to send their plans, how they are going to spend the money is the recovery and the resilience plans. And they have to mention the sectors where they are going to, to spend this money is, uh, is shorter terms for years than the budget, but is, is quite good because it's flexible and most of the time it can be 100%. Um, and as far as I know, um, higher education and the more uh, science in itself uh, are not very much considered in this plan. So um, there are a lot of innovation uh, for the digital and the green transition, but member states may include 
uh, more science and higher education in the, in the plants, like culture. And we have been drawing the attention uh, because this is up to the member states to choose their priorities. Of course, it has to be approved by the, the European Commission, but uh, the initiative of, of uh, indicating the, the, the priority areas, it depends on the, on the member states. So uh, it will be important because these are um, funds to help the sectors that have suffered more from the the pandemic crisis and uh, high, higher education research institutions they have suffered and they they would need help because they they will contribute a lot for the solution of the problems both in terms directly of the the health uh, find solutions in the health sector but also for the, the economy, the digital transition, the green technologies, the, 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 the researchers in higher education is going to contribute a lot. So the, some of the countries have entered in public consultations like my own, they have started a public consultation uh, actually today about their resilient plans. Uh, and I, uh, I warn you that it's important to look at the plans of your own member states and uh, to try to push that these sectors are well represented. Absolutely. Okay, that's actually um, a, a quite a good idea. We actually do plan on sending out a follow up email to this webinar in a couple of days to all the participants in this webinar. Um, perhaps we can find a link to that to include in that follow up email um, of where they can find of, of where all the participants who are currently watching this can find more information about that um, and how they can contribute to the public consultation. Yeah. Um, Yes, Wim. Thank you, uh, Chloe. Um, I'd like to raise the following. I think we're somehow in this discussion focused sometimes a bit too much on getting money, extra money, which is important, but it's only part of the solution, I think, because you have to somehow also break the circle. If, you're, if you want to prevent this system of people jumping from one short-term position to another. Sure, you can prolong the contracts, et cetera, but you have to then also face the question that you have to have an, I would say, open and transparent system of evaluating the people, but also accept that if the system doesn't explode, then you have to accept that also some people after two or four years have to well, leave academia and find jobs somewhere else. So you, it goes together, I think, with a, a fair and transparent and open evaluation system at the universities. Yeah, I can, I can say actually that that links quite strongly to what Rachel was saying about needing to gather more evidence um, to work out what is actually needed. And my question to, to both of you and actually to anyone on the panel who wants to answer this is, where should we, we be gathering this evidence from and who should be doing this? Should this be done on, on a member state level or should it be done by international organisations? Um, should it be a European-led study? What are your thoughts? And maybe I'll start with Rachel. So I think, I mean, there have been some attempts to do this by organizations already. So the ESF had a, a publication, I think 2017, where they, they really tried to do some career tracking to, to help provide evidence for this. I think one, two problems have to be overcome which I think means it has to be really a big consortium effort with lots of stakeholders. The first is obviously the national differences. You need someone who can understand the, both the academic careers, but also the, the environment related to that in that country. And secondly, I think you need people from that domain. Um, it's very different looking at the careers of life scientists than it would the careers of um, social scientists. Um, so I think it's something where you, we would need some major project, maybe led with European funds, but having a large number of stakeholders from different groups that really understand the, the careers of different types of academics and the types of careers they go into. Um, yeah. And maybe it also needs some consultation with industry on what their needs are in terms of um, skills and, and so on. Yeah, 
from Maria H. Mastepin? Maria Evangeva, yeah, sorry. So, I mean, I think, like, I'm happy to speak about evidence, but I'm also a sociologist and anthropologist of higher education working on academic labor. And I can tell you what kind of bad evidence we are getting from national agencies and institutions, because a lot of times you have a lot of very um, kind of euphemistic umbrella term, for instance, for full-time equivalents under which you see hourly based contracts. You see a, a kind of the, the um, professionalizing, the skilling of uh, how researchers' careers are called. Like you, you know, this idea that somebody is a postdoctoral research fellow is almost gone in places like the one where I work in the UK. Now we have postdoctoral research assistant, we have postdoctoral research intern, we have uh, people in Ireland, um, you know, being called as postdocs trainees and uh, head of school swearing under oath that they treat postdocs as PhDs. So like as students rather than as colleagues. So we're having a, a kind of very dangerous um, environment in which institutions and nations and sometimes are not willing to give this evidence. And it's one thing to go grassroots and, you know, like really go as partly with it with EASA by, by picking up membership outside of institutions. And there we could have a picture of the anthropological career in Europe with the limitation that these are the members of EASA rather than all the anthropologists in Europe and has together a specific type of membership who are people who can afford to pay fee, who can afford to come to conferences and so on forth. So a very vast proportion were those in Western countries. You know, so again, Eastern Europe was much less represented, only 9% of all the respondents in this survey. And, and about that, many are also members of EASA. Um, so, so we're having that, you know, like, problem with evidence, which is who are the, like when you're speaking of stakeholders, who are the people who can ask these questions? You know, can we have, for instance, members of parliament ask national agencies like the Higher Education Authority in Ireland to actually gather the true numbers of precarious research or precarious teaching careers? Because we are having in Ireland, like a statement from the Higher Education Authority of 80% of all careers in academia are permanent. This is not this is not true, but you but you can't gather this evidence unless you really put pressure in in specific points. So so this first part, you know, when we're speaking about evidence, let's speak about how um, institutions are using HR in order to protect themselves. How only private companies are allowed to do institution wide surveys, and instead of contracting their own staff members who do social science, a lot of institutions are doing you know the opposite. So this is, I think, a, a much kind of bigger question. Then the second, of course, you know, where do we go from from there when it comes to uh, you know like giving. Uh, funding across the board. I mean, I, I think it is quite sure that there should be a bigger framework for academic careers across Europe. It can't be left to, to nation states because at present, the mobility of academic careers, not without thanks to frameworks like Marie Curie and you know Horizon 2020 and so on and so forth, that has been increased mobility has made um, a lot of realities untranslatable across national borders. So we're having people that are jumping from one system to another. Pensions are different, benefits are different, names are different, and so on and so forth. So we're having a kind of push from the top at institutional and sometimes national level to de-skilling, deprofessionalization. There should be a push from the bottom to, to go against that and the push for data should come from the bottom as well but should be you know ideally that's how um, ISC and other lobbying organizations can help can be supported by progressive members of European Parliament hopefully can be supported by you know, progressive points of influence within the system that can force a conversation on the actual evidence and not on something that you know a broad number of stakeholders that usually have the interest to hide that rather than to review them will kind of achieve. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I do really want to pick up on the the idea that you mentioned the research career framework. Before I do that, I do want to give other members of the panel a chance to respond to that. Um, and I'm also very aware I keep promising our, our attendees I'm going to answer their questions. So first, I'll open up to, um, to anyone else who wants to comment on what Maria just said. I think that the question of evidence is a question of quality of the data that mm -hmm. I agree because there is a, there is plenty of I usually find what I need OECD European Commission uh, even the, the also the European Parliament has a study department uh, but they rely a lot of, on the data that are uh, given by the member states and the, the member states that I know better I can. Uh, compare what I know from with the data and I feel there is a, a little bit of a cover-up uh, of the data usually to, to, to look better than the, the situation, the real situation, uh, in both in terms of investment uh, the, as percentage of the GDP uh, on science and innovation, both in terms of careers. The, 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 the figures are uh, in, the, in this uh, uh, studies are much better than the reality. You, you can see the trends, but uh, not absolutely well. So I think that uh, is, is a question mainly on uh, the quality of the data. Uh, the, the research career framework, I think that is a very, uh, is a very good idea. It's, uh, um, it's difficult to implement. Uh, the commission has been working on the, the pensions uh, not only for researchers, but for for uh, uh, in general for people for the Europeans that go from one country to the other is a nightmare, you know, because there is a lot of incompatibilities between the different systems of uh, pensions. Uh, but in order to get a, a mobility and internal market, we, we really need to to have that. Is something that is very important. Um, so uh, I took note of that is, is uh, uh, the question of pensions, benefits, uh, conditions are uh, um, that we at least we continue to push, even if it's not solved immediately, but that we continue to push on that direction would be very important too. Great. Thank you so much. So I am going to actually just turn now to the, the questions some of the attendees have been asking and they are coming in quite quickly. So I'm going to get to as many of them as possible. Um, the first one I think is a, is a really great question. So I'm just going to read it out for you now, which is current systems select those that can survive in this hyper competitive research environment and not necessarily those that, who are excellent researchers and managers. How will Europe ensure excellent research ideas and support excellent researchers and not just select those who are in the lucky position to survive in the current system? Swim, do you want to jump in first? Sure. Yeah. I think actually Maria's suggestion of some kind of a research career framework would already be an important step, even if it's not like a framework program, but sort of a, a reference frame for this is what we aim for. And you could even think in terms of, say, a number of points that, that you could then take a particular institution and sort of rate it according to that, that system. That would already be a help and a step in the right direction. I would like to, I fully understand this question. I think it's a good question, but it's also sometimes the problem that a department is, is facing. I mean, if, if a department can on, in some sense only continue with getting sufficient outside funding to their researchers that are successful in applying, it's a vicious circle. So again, you have to, it's, you have to do it at this level of maybe a uh, research career framework, but in addition, also trying to stay de restabilize the funding system. Rachel, do you wanna make a comment as well? Yeah, I mean, I think here, it's really difficult. I think the only thing I can see is really putting more funds in for the first independent step so that we take more people out from this precarious situation and give more people a chance as as PIs. 
but that comes with with obviously equal trade-offs we will then lose some talented researchers who would have stayed in longer i think there is another co-other kind of host of problems there that we might have to face before doing that and one is related to one of the topics that we've picked up with Precantro um, as core to the problem of precarious research, which is authorship, which is the question of how ideas are authored, both in terms of publications and in terms of fundraising. So at present, the problem is in a way solved. We, we are not lacking good ideas in research. We are lacking attribution of the good ideas to their actual authors. And we're having a system that is increasingly um, kind of collecting the, you know, allowing PIs and allowing people in power in institutions to appropriate ideas and through mechanisms of authorship and through mechanisms of, you know, who's eligible for research funding. So, for instance, again, I'm based in England. In England, at the postdoc level, you have very few, uh, el like, grants that you're eligible to apply for. You are encouraged literally by your institution as postdoc to give your idea to your PI or another member of faculty who will apply for it. And you might eventually through an open competition be granted the opportunity to apply for a second postdoc on your own project. This is not something that I'm telling you under the carpet. You know, this is something that I've been taught on training where 50 postdocs come to be trained how to apply for their PIs, you know, and when I, when I've challenged the HR, you know, they say, no, that's how it is. You know, this, this is not in our hands. It's in the hands of the funding agencies. It's UKRI, ESRC, and so on and so forth. So, so we're having already this system, which, is, which needs to be broken. And in order to do that, we need to speak about ethics of authorship, ethics of hiring, ethics of research, you know, and, and that already kind of creates a necessity to open the Pandora box of, of how you know, research is funded. So, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking that we might, if we just say good ideas are not given an opportunity, we might be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We have to think of, you know, how good ideas are produced and what it means to be, not all PIs are bad PIs, you know, but what it means to be a PI, for instance, within a big project that like helps the career of their postdocs and the TIs, the, the TIs, you know, teaching assistants that are helping? How do we not block those that are replacement teaching for you from a career opportunity and so forth? You know, like, so this is, this is, I think, something that we have to be very careful about. And just, uh, and I would agree with Vim that just uh, pumping more money into the system is not gonna help because if we carry on giving all this money to headhunted professors of, on top of the pyramid, rather than having a mechanism to redistribute it more evenly, we're going to end up with the same situation. We're going to end up with the same people getting more and more money on top and then having a, a reserve army that is never going to be able to make it. But the competition is becoming more and more severe. And so, so we're having already academics living on food coupons. And there are these kind of heroic stories of how you survive on 10,000 euros a month in a big European capital. So, so like we have to really change the discussion of how science and research are done at European universities and research centers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think that brings up a really important question of how can we better support the career progression of early career scientists? Um, and so obviously, Marie, you, you covered a couple of things just then, but do any of the other speakers have any ideas about how we could support early career scientists? Maybe that I could pick up on one point that Maria mentioned and it's actually also mentioned by one of the attendees in, in the comments and that is that I mean when we're funding a large number of the early career researchers on project grants that comes with several problems. The PI as we know is the one that applies for that and either as you as Maria and the, the person who, who commented mentioned postdoc contributes to that and is not attributed and the, the the solution suggested in the comments is that these projects should enable the postdoc to be a co-PI always on those grants and I think that's a really nice way uh, of, of, sol of not solving that but helping a little bit um, 
And that would also help with a second problem of funding people from project grants, and that's that to make this transition from the postdoc phase to the PI phase, you need to gain independence. And that's very difficult if you're working on a project grant where due to your funding conditions, you can only work on that project and you're not able to develop your own ideas. Um, and I think having more funding available for kind of late postdocs to work on some preliminary work that could form the basis of their independent career would also be very helpful. I can see Wim wanting to jump in, I think. Well, well I can. I um, Let me say, I'll try what Maria is describing, I don't personally recognize, but I think it's clear that some of the things she's describing are, I would say, unethical against the values of science. And certainly we sh in terms of HR department saying that, that young researchers like postdocs get training how to provide ideas to their PIs. I think that's pretty terrible. And we should try to take action against these things. And in a way, while we have this discussion, I think Maria's suggestion of a sort of a research career framework, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what should you do, do's and don'ts, is quite a, a nice idea of at least starting somewhere. Because then there is something to gauge some of these problematic experiences uh, against. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria Cavallo, do you do you want to jump in at all? This may be... uh, there is maybe. Uh, I agree that there is a lot of fear in what Maria said on uh, um, ethics and code of conduct and uh, um, even integrity uh, of research. And the uh, uh, European Commission has uh, also pushed a lot of this work. Uh, together with academies, ALE and the uh, European Academy has done a quite, a, quite a, 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 a lot of work and there is a, co a code that they have developed and this is followed by the European institutions and the, I think is mentioned, it was mentioned in the annex of the contract of Horizon 2020 and I suppose we will continue in Horizon Europe. Um, Another, uh, uh, I saw in the comments, I don't know if you are going to ask, there was a question addressed to me uh, uh, that uh, uh, if uh, precarity of researchers is going to become an issue uh, uh, in the European Parliament and if I mentioned that we are going to issue a statement on this subject, what I said is that in the scope of the resolution of European research area, I'm going to put forward this as one of the points, this is a is, a, is an important a point that is important to be there. Of course, this is going to be negotiated with other uh, political groups, but uh, I um, I believe that is something that we will be uh, quite uh, uh, consensual uh, uh, across the political group. So I hope that in the final resolution we have uh, a point addressing this because it's one of the problems that we have in the European research area. Um, one point that we didn't discuss, I think that was one mentioned by Maria, is the, that the, the um, funding based, uh, the funding directly the, the individual, the researcher or the innovation, uh, the innovator, or funding the institutions. Um, in the last uh, few years, uh, quite recent, the tendency has been to move more and more to the research, uh, to funding the researcher or the innovator. With the European Research Council now, with the European uh, Innovation Council, um, and less funding the institutions, at, at least at European level. Um, and I think that that's in the member states, in most of them is happening the same. I suppose we need a balance because the institutional um, funding um, gives the, the baseline uh, for the sustainable uh, funding to hire people in a more permanent way. Um, and the, 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 at European level, we, we again do this based on the, the idea that at member states they do more institutional um, funding 
the funding of the institutions, then the, the European funds can be more to the, the, the researcher and to the innovator. But we really need to, in the summing together the member states and the, the European fund to make sure that there is a balance between the two systems of funding. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for answering that question too. That was actually next on my list to answer. So you saved me from asking a question, which is always great. Um, so we actually don't have that much time left. So I'm just going to ask one more question. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to sort of highlight one or maybe two recommendations that they really think um, should be focused on to improve improve the current funding system in Europe. Um, so the question I am going to ask is actually relating to how EU institutions, universities and scientific associations and organisations can actually better work together. Um, right now, I personally have the feeling that it's, it's quite individualised and quite separate and there aren't really enough coalitions between these different groups. Um, so how can they better work together to address some of the systematic problems that we've talked about today? I know that is quite a complex question. So does anyone want to volunteer to answer it first? Do I have to uh, uh, volunteer someone myself? I can see Vim laughing. So maybe Vim, if you want to unmute yourself, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's a tough question. Um, it is. <laughs> because it, it indeed also, as I said in the beginning, the 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 um, science systems of the member states are quite different, and you're easily getting in interference with the um, well with what is supposed to be a prerogative of the member state. But I do think along the lines, and I saw in the chat that several people also point to. Uh, a charter on code for researchers, etc. At that level, making that more known, because of course, through the European programs, we do see increased uh, mobility, and and in principle, there there is a possibility at the European level to promote more uniform standards, including uh, saying what should not happen, because that's I think what's coming out of this discussion, and. I just want to repeat again two, two terms that I used before, open, openness and transparency in the system. That also means an evaluation of people and appointment of people. So I think along these lines, we can still make quite a bit of progress in Europe. Thanks. And Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with when I think the, the best way would be things like the um, the Concorda and the yeah the um, the European equivalent that's also being discussed quite a lot in, in the chat right now. Um, really working on these defined frameworks for what things should look like and then all stakeholders contributing and, and encouraging this. Okay, great. Maria Vengeva, anything to add to this particular question? Well, I, I carry on thinking that uh, speaking about just researchers' careers is throwing the baby out with the bathwater because we have to speak about academic careers, you know, when we're speaking about what we're speaking now. And then we have to take teaching into account and we have to think of, you know, education as a broader process in which research-based teaching cannot be done by teaching only faculty. You know, this is something that we're, we're kind of coming to this paradox increasingly. I think the who, who has to be on the table is a very good question. But I think that the question is, you know, whoever has the money has, you know, at least some part of the money, which is at least at a certain level, you know, the European Union, when it comes to certain frameworks and certain redistributive functions, has the right not just to be on the table, but to dictate the rules and to dictate some sanctions around them. And there is a question of how money is distributed to different member states and how monitoring is done in order to make sure that they are keeping up with the prudence that's necessary in order to you know, comply with, with certain rules. But then I think the, the kind of overall question also is on the, on 
within each and every research institution, there has to be a debate about, you know, where do we stand? And, and beyond the question of this framework, we're also proposing in our survey report something like an Athena's One Award, which would be like, this is a, an award for kind of, you know, changing the gender disbalance, especially in the STEM sciences, but in academia in general, like how do we make sure that guidance is for and awards for good hiring practices of, you know, uh, and, and making uh, precarious folks more permanent are, you know, acknowledged, awarded, and uh, there is an incentive for other institutions to follow suit. And I think, you know, we, we have to be thinking in this way and we have to be thinking in terms of sanctions and awards and not just, you know, these kind of nice documents that then don't produce any results. Okay, thanks so much. And Maria Cavallo, do you, do you want to add anything to this question? I want to, to draw the attention that uh, uh, the research, the, the academic careers uh, to work at the European level, we have always the difficult of the education to be a, a, a policy that is responsibility of the member states. And actually, the member states are quite protective in this uh, policy and every time that uh, it's something that touch their, their responsibility, we, um, they, they react. They, there was two areas that uh, uh, member states were very protective, uh, education and health. Health is less so because this crisis has shown that the importance of acting at European level and now we have a the scope to, to work much more on health together at European level and even globally than we had in the past. But in education is still, uh, is still the case. Um, I think that there are uh, already a, a lot of institutions at uh, European level that uh, um, the work uh, can be done uh, in collaboration from uh, academies to uh, associations. The, so um, I would say that there is uh, probably a bit of dispersion already. So is, you really need to put together the, the different actors that are working and uh, to, to draw the conclusion. So there are already uh, many associations from academies to, to, um, to more uh, um, associations of research institutions or association of universities but it is, is a problem there is a need to 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 streamline and to push these associations to work together great thank you so much so i mean within that last question i just asked we've already had quite a number of, of clear recommendations and clear suggestions of actions that do need to happen um but i do want to give this this opportunity we, we have about seven minutes left of this webinar and i just want to give each speaker the opportunity to to highlight a couple of the key recommendations or the key things that they have they think have to happen um for for the current funding system in Europe to be improved. Um, and so, yeah, I'll give you the opportunity if, if uh, you want to say something in particular, any final words for this particular webinar, um, now is the opportunity for you to do that. So again, I'll start with Wim. I'm, I'm, I'm showing who's, who's coming up first on my screen is who I'm reading out, so. <laughs> okay. Um... I think most of it has been said already on, on this issue. I do want to bring up one thing that hasn't been touched on so much, but indirectly by Maria. Um, also in, in my country, which is quite successful in the European programs, there's increasing discussion and agreement that we should make the European programs, which by and large are based on competition, but we then see countries that are um, not profiting enough from it and where we definitely have to work on the European level to increase the science capacity. And I'm thinking, well, Maria's from Bulgaria, countries like that that are not very successful in ERC, to find a balance, still having these, these applications being based on, on excellence, but still find a way to also increase capacity 
and participation from a number of other countries, the, in particular the newer member states. That is an, a big challenge, which in the end will touch on the, uh, the, the position of young academics. Because they're being lured away often to the West, and it's also important that they get their positions again and move back also to their home countries. And I mean, I would say that the, the biggest thing we can change, which has been mentioned several times and is a, something that um, will be difficult, but I think is necessary, is really making sure that there is more institutional funding and more of that institutional funding goes into permanent positions, whether that's at the staff scientist level or um, group leaders or in teaching, that. I think has to be decided by the individual institutions, but I think there needs to be more permanence. Thanks, Rachel. So Maria Ivanshiva. Um, well, I think beyond what has been said, I think there is a, like maybe, you know, just a couple of points. One is that I think it is important and this webinar and other similar initiatives are starting to show it that the conversation in Europe should stop being how much money goes for science, but it should be where does the money going for science actually end up, you know, and how it is redistributed. You know, that first. I think there there is a bigger question about how do we create sustainable like institutions of research and education rather than splitting them and turning them into two competing or incompatible businesses. I think that's another important one. And then of course, you know, the like having sanctions and incentives for achieving this goal is important and having a framework that ensures that everybody who wishes to stay in, for instance, an academic profession can do that is important. And I think it is like, we're, we're speaking as if there are not enough humans that want to have education in the world, which is not true. We're still like very far with a lot of countries under the, the kind of even um, kind of mass higher education, let, let alone universal education achievement. So, so we're speaking of a situation where instead of having more students in and more faculty to teach, we're having less faculty to teach more students who enter less prepared because universities don't invest in preparation. And this is all something that I think science and popular science and research and teaching and, and all aspects and service of universities should engage in, but we have to change the, com the conversation on which term funding is provided in order to make this system happen and not make it turn into a market. Thanks. And finally, Maria Cavallo, any final words? Um, I think that most of the things were said, I would uh, probably uh, stress three areas, the sustainability in, in terms of timing, uh, of the contracts and uh, of the projects and uh, to, to get more sustainable uh, institutions. The second, the, the working conditions to get better working conditions. And the third, uh, 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 to really try to get a solution for the pensions, uh, the compatibility between member states of uh, uh, rights and uh, pensions is uh, probably one a very important uh, topic. Uh, I'll probably stress these three years. I'll, they were already mentioned that there's important topics to conclude. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you to, to all of our speakers who have joined us here today. It has been a really, really interesting discussion. I think a lot of really important points were raised. 
um, and a lot of really nice recommendations towards the end. I'd also really like to thank everyone who participated in this webinar today as an attendee. We had a, as a lot of the speakers actually mentioned, we had a lot of discussion both in the chat and in the Q&A, which led to an even more productive discussion. Um, we hope that you join us in the following two webinars as well that will also be run by ISC on the other two topics. Um, and also just to let you know that this webinar has been recorded. So if you'd like to rewatch any parts or share it with um, anyone that you think might be interested, you can do that. We will be sending you a follow-up email in about two days time that will have a link to the recording. Um, so you can share that or rewatch this webinar. So thank you again to all of our speakers um, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.